Welcome to episode 181 of the Daniel Yoris Podcast with today's guest, Jeff Packman. Let's go. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. Joined here today by the keto vegan master himself, Jeff Packman. Jeff, what's up, man? What's going on, man? That is uh, that is not the intro I wanted, <laughs> but you know what? I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. No, cor- correct, correct me. I just, I just haven't stopped talk thinking about that since we did uh, your podcast last. But man, we'll, we'll talk about that story because there are some things that I want to uh, discuss from that here. But, but give yourself a proper introduction. You are not the keto vegan man. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, I'm Jeff Pakman, owner of uh, Jeff Pakman Fitness. I know very original name. Um, I've been a personal trainer slash coach slash chef slash taxi driver slash cab driver slash i mean i've done a lot of different shit and i think the only thing that's ever the only thing that's ever stuck with me is uh is helping people with their health and fitness and i was a big boy and i lost a considerable amount of weight lost over 80 pounds myself and changed my life changed my habits i did a lot of unsustainable things in the process and through that i learned uh, what to do and what not to do. And I can relate with the cereal yo-yo dieter, the, the person who's been struggling with the same 20, 25 pounds, putting it on and losing it every year. So that was me. And, uh, and I made it through that and you can too. So that's kind of what I teach people how to, how to do is how to, how to do this thing the right way. Having been through that, how do you suggest people avoid falling into these traps for lack of a better word you hear some fancy new diet some fancy new crazy workout this is the best thing ever this is the new craze and it sounds great because like oh my god look at all these testimonials look at all this stuff you know debbie lost 37 pounds in two weeks and like okay it sounds great but how do you go about navigating that so you don't fall into these traps yeah it's a great question i think a lot of people We'll get bombarded with this stuff on their, you know, through ads or through like, okay, f- like for me personally, I, I got targeted through an ad and it was like vegan keto was the way to go. Right. And so I signed up with this guy for a four weeks of free coaching and he brought me through it and it worked. It was like, oh, it's all about hormones. It's all about metabolism. It's all about this. And it worked. It was the first thing that worked in a long time of me not understanding a calorie deficit and how it works. And so I think me just not being super knowledgeable and having tried a lot of other stuff and not just using common sense and not following the right people, it was really easy for me to get brainwashed. It was almost like I, like I had thought myself into a hole of overthinking it and overthinking it where the solution was right in front of my eyes. And so I think curating your feed on social media, if you see somebody trying to push these like supplements and products to you, just unfollow them. If you see like this person at the office is doing keto and they lost 25 pounds in a month and they're like always talking about it, just understand that what is unsustainable that like those results are not going to last and so if you can just switch your mindset into something more reasonable and make those changes gradual over time you're actually going to be able to stick with it so yeah i think i think also right now we're in this era where anybody can be a coach anybody can be like a health coach these multi-level marketing companies like beach body and other companies like this. I see Beachbody a lot. I see a lot of people that I went to high school with like pushing Beachbody in these ketone drinks and liquid collagen to melt the belly fat, like all this BS. And I just, I want to post on there and be like, stop misleading people. But they actually don't know. They don't know themselves because they, they don't, they haven't been educated properly. So I think curating your feed, following some great creators like Daniel, following me, following, you know, Jordan Syed is awesome. That's who I learned a lot of this stuff from when I was younger. And I, I mean, just just find people that talk about sustainability. And if you pretty much, you search the word calorie deficit, you're probably going to find pe- like more creators that are actually more nuance-based and evidence-based through this stuff. 
an idea that I've been really coming around to over the past several weeks, more specifically, is that these programs like you're talking about, where they promote some nonsense, I, I almost don't think that they're actually malicious a lot of the times. I, I actually believe that they are incompetent. And they just think that 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 works. They don't know what they don't know. They haven't tried enough things. They tried one thing and it worked because like we've talked, we've both talked about this many times, but you do some weird diet that makes you eat less food. What that actually does is put you in a calorie deficit. Therefore, you lose weight. Of course, it works. If anything that makes you eat less food is going to make mm-hmm. you lose weight. Mm-hmm. And so they think it works and it doesn't work for everyone, but it works for some people. And if it didn't work for you, then it's like a you problem, not a their system problem in their mind. And so I think it's actually just incompetency, which is, which is really sad because we have so much education available out there and knowing these basic scientific principles, it's not, it's not that you don't need a PhD in biochemistry to understand that a calorie deficit is how you lose fat. So it's, it actually is a, a upsetting that that's the, that seems to be the case. The other side of it, and you know, something that I wanted to ask you about is what was your like what was your mindset like at that time when you were hit with that vegan keto ad? Because for someone who's uneducated and not a trainer, not a whatever, of course you don't know these things because why would you know these things, right? But what was going on in your head at that point when you saw this and you're like, okay, maybe I've tried everything, but this is the one that's really gonna help me out. Like, what, where was your mindset at when that when that happened? Yeah, so I personally had this thought in my head that I was like, that carbs were like not good. Like carbs were the problem because I had tried things in the past where I had mainly eaten like low carb. And what happens when you eat low carb, right? Your your weight drops pretty quickly and you're like, oh my God, this is working. This is working, right? It's got to be the carbs. But not knowing any better, not knowing how glycogen works and how carbs are stored in the body and how, you know, for every one gram of carbohydrates, you store three grams of water. And so it's like not knowing these things, I thought it was carbs. I thought, oh, my body's just, this is the, the, the way that my ancestors ate, right? Is like, oh, they, they didn't, they must have not eaten these refined carbs. Or maybe it's the way that, the the wheat is grown in the US or maybe it's this or maybe it's you know the GMOs I was looking for any reason as to why it wasn't working for me and when I would eat lower carbs I would see results right so pretty soon I went plant-based and this was around the time when like being plant-based was like really really popular this was like everyone and their mom was going vegan at least in the US it was nuts and I think it was from a couple documentaries that dropped on Netflix at the time and they were just talking about how meat causes cancer and this and that and you know it causes colon problems and you can't absorb all the protein from it and plant protein is better for you and this and that and so at the time I was working actually for a plant-based restaurant I was a chef and I so I was like, I'm going to give myself a challenge. Actually, the owner of the restaurant challenged me to go plant-based for 30 days. He's like, watch, dude, your skin's going to clear up. You're going to drop weight. You're going to feel so much more. You're going to have so much more energy. And I was like, cool, I'll try it, right? I can do it for 30 days. I work here. I can just eat here. <laughs> so I did it 30 days later. And of course, like, who knows if it was placebo effect? Who knows if I was in a calorie deficit just because I was eating a lot more whole foods than I normally was? But I dropped the weight, my skin cleared up, I felt great, right? Everything felt stronger. I was like, oh, this is the way to go. So I ended up traveling with that restaurant and I ended up like diving deeper and following all these plant-based accounts on YouTube and Instagram. And of course, I got sucked into that world, right? And not to say that there's anything wrong with that world, but there was a lot of pseudoscience in that world as well. So I got sucked into a lot of pseudoscience. And then there were people who were like, hey, I feel terrible uh, eating high carb plant based. So I'm going to go low carb plant based. So then I looked up, how do you even do that? That seems impossible. So I looked it up. And of course, high fat, um, you know, pretty low protein and pretty low carbohydrates. Like it was pretty, it was pretty unsustainable. But like, I would look up, okay, well, are people doing keto this way? Or like, how can you do keto plant-based? And there was only a couple of people making content about it. So when I started looking for that, 
I think I got targeted with the ads and it was like this super ripped guy and he was talking about how vegan keto was like the only thing that ever worked for him and he used to be a big guy like me and got targeted with it and I was like meh I'll try it it's four weeks free coaching right and it was awesome like he had a a strength training app he had um he had recipes he had I could talk to him one-on-one we did weekly check-ins and it was awesome. It was actually great. The only thing that wasn't great was he was basically having me fast for 48 hours, sometimes even longer. I was pricking myself with a, a, uh, a keto, like keto meter to like check my, my, uh, ketones in my blood. And then I was, uh, I was just eating super high fat, um, plant based foods, like tons of macadamia nuts, tons of, Tons of nuts, tons of seeds, tons of avocados and veggies and tons of avocado oil. And I'd put the MCT oil and coconut oil in my coffee. And like, man, I can't tell you how like weird my energy levels were. Like one minute I'd be jacked up, like super high energy. You couldn't stop me. I could I could run faster than a freight train. And then the next moment I would need a nap like it was just highs and lows, highs and lows, right? And then I'd, I'd go into my 48 hour fast, my 72 hour fast. And then I'd, you know, every weekend would be a cheat day. Every weekend would be Saturday and Sunday, as many carbs as I would eat, as much BS as I could eat. And then Monday I'd go into the fast. And so it almost created this pretty bad binge and restrict cycle for me to where when I stopped doing this coaching with him, I like I ended up hiring him for as a coach. But when I ended up stopping coaching with him, I gained all the way back. I gained like, I think, 50, 60 plus pounds over the course of a, a you know, a couple years. And then uh, and then I was in a much worse spot because then I was like, I don't I don't want to go back to doing that. And so that was around the time when I was like, OK, I'm going to actually just start tracking my calories, eat, eating more protein, like get back to the basics. And that's when I started following good creators and, uh, and people with messages that I need to hear like, Hey, stop doing this unsustainable bullshit. It was like, they were talking directly to me and I was like, okay, cool. This is, these are, I've been through this. Now I need to start thinking about how I can help other people get through this. Cause there's not enough people making good content out there. And there's a lot of people making bs diet stuff out there so yeah and think about how many people would have been maybe not exactly the same scenario but a similar story to you right where you can speak to that because you've been through those those same emotions and those same that same like kind of cascade of events where you happen to be working at a plant-based restaurant the guy happened to challenge you and you happen to start it and it kind of worked and then you know the way the ad cycle is now is very good like the algorithms on social media are very very good and yep. so you start looking for something, it's going to feed you more of that and more of that and more of that. And it feeds your own internal bias that's, that's been created. And then you just, you know, kind of keep going down the rabbit hole there. But, um, it, it's, it's very impressive to then like be able to kind of pull yourself out of that. But I'll also ask you this, looking back on all that now, do you regret doing that? No, no. I, I try to not have any regrets with anything, um, because like if it wasn't for that I wouldn't have a story first of all I wouldn't be able to relate to the clients that I do have right so I think it gave me a clear and concise image of who I want to work with and who I want to help and it helped me put myself in their shoes yeah I mean the only way to the only way to find the limit is to cross it and sometimes mm-hmm. you gotta you gotta you gotta do that to figure out like okay that was too much so it's something between that and you know doing nothing that's where the answer lies right and then you can kind of you know you wiggle your way towards uh towards the truth which is which is difficult and takes a long time but it's possible yeah i mean i mean i definitely have an addictive personality i have that all or nothing mentality like if i'm gonna do something i'm going all in on it and so i this taught me how to be a little bit more like balanced and that's something i didn't know before you know i i come from a background of you know drug addiction and um and jail and so like i've had a pretty crazy past with like overindulgence and too much stimulation and like an addiction to 
dopamine, right? And addiction to those quick results and addiction to like, I don't like this feeling, get rid of it. Like, you know, just like, so that, that was my whole life, you know, growing up. So then coming into the fitness space, looking for that same dopamine hit in the form of dieting, getting results, get it. I need it. I need it now. I need it right now. But it doesn't work like that. And, and at least if you want it to last, it doesn't work like that. And so, you know, it's been good for me to learn the process of how to be more balanced. Having said that, there are, I believe, there are times where it is valid to go really hard for a month or for six weeks or, you know, for a short period of time. Do you ever advise people on that? And and what are your thoughts around like, okay, for this next eight weeks, like we're just going to bear down. We're going to drop the calories like pretty low, but not like dangerously low. We're going to like five workouts, no missing, 15 K steps a day. Like we're fucking checking all the boxes, double checking them. When do you think that is a right idea? If, if at all. Yeah. So personally, yes, I do think that that, that strategy works for a specific kind of person. Um, I think it's like give you what you want so we can give you what you need kind of thing. So like everybody wants results really fast. So if I can bring somebody through an intense aggressive fat loss phase for eight weeks where I'm like, we're going all in here. I want this to be the only thing that you focus on for the next eight weeks. Like this is your number one focus for eight weeks. They will do incredibly well. But if you try to push it past that point, they'll likely fall off and go back to their old behaviors. Like if I did the vegan keto thing for eight weeks, got results, and then he showed me how to do it sustainably from there, I would have been fine. Mm -hmm. But it's the binge and restrict cycle of doing it for a long period of time. It's the roller coaster ride of doing like being in that aggressive mindset for too long, I think is what causes harm and problems. So I have... Like I have a rapid fat loss eight week group that I, you know, I did one in January. I'm going to be doing another one. And when I do this, like it's, I teach people how to do it the right way. It's aggressive. It's all in. But after that, we go into sustainability. We talk about maintenance. We talk about why you should not keep going with this exact (laughs) protocol past this eight weeks. And I, I spend a lot of time talking about how this is not sustainable. This is not supposed to be sustainable. But what we're going to do after this is going to be sustainable. So yes, I do think that it works very well for some people. Yeah, totally agreed with that. Because, and for sure, it's not for everyone. Because some people really can't handle that. Like, okay, we're going super hard. They think that they can do it, but like logistically in their life, it's not a good time because they've got vacation stuff at work, you know, whatever things that are going to get in the way of that or make it harder than it's already going to be. Um, that plus handling the, like the, the, the bounce back into a more sustainable maintenance after I think one of the most important pieces of those aggressive stints is actually having a predetermined plan for when it's done. Like this yeah. is lasting eight weeks. And then on week nine, I'm doing this instead. Because otherwise, it's really hard to just like go into something normal. You're way more likely to to binge and just kind of go back to whatever you're doing and then undo all of that, all of that work you just did over eight weeks. Yeah, it, it's like if you know there's an end date in sight, it's a lot easier to be more consistent with what you're doing. That's why like, you know, I'm sure you do this with your clients, like giving them maintenance breaks and things like that, like being like, okay, you've got this social event coming up at the end of the summer, like let's push really hard and give you a little bit more aggressive whatever program until that point and then we'll take a week off or we'll take a deload break at the end of this training program or whatever and so when you have something to look forward to that's like oh i get i get to eat a little bit more food or you know i'm gonna be on vacation and not track for a week or whatever it allows you to be more consistent in the short term because you have something to look forward to i even use it as just a way of practicing maintenance. It's not even always followed or, or preceded by uh, an aggressive period. It's like, okay, I'm going on vacation for this week. Like, well, we're not losing fat then. Like we're out of the deficit. Like we're at maintenance. Cause at some point, like we're going to finish the fat loss goal. You know, you wanted to lose 10, 15, 30 pounds. Fine. Eventually we're going to lose that. And then what's going to happen in your life after that, that's where you more or less just like live at maintenance for basically forever, you know, plus or minus five to 10 pounds. And so having these little, you know, weeks or a couple weeks or whatever along the way is I've found to be a good way to just practice this because eventually we got to get there forever. So if we can find ways to practice and life, I think is going to give it to us 
naturally anyways. Again, vacations, work events, you know, who knows? These things are, are just going to come up and we might as well not fight it. Yeah, it's nice when you don't have to go into a deficit to lose, you know, 25 pounds every single year. And instead, you just go into like a four week mini cut to lose five pounds to lean up for the summertime or whatever. Mm -hmm. It That's way nicer to be like within striking distance of your goals rather than, you know, having to go through this grueling, you know, 25, 30 weeks plus like fat loss fit. Like it sucks. Like, let's be honest, being in a deficit, it sucks. It sucks. You might as well. Like, go a little bit more aggressive for eight weeks, get get it done, and then, like, move into something a little bit less aggressive from there. And I think I think a lot of people would do well with it if it was structured the right way. Yeah. I think, like you said there, though, it, it's also about being within striking distance of whatever that end goal is. Yeah. I'm not sure that if you had, like, 50 pounds to lose, doing some really aggressive thing would be the thing to do because yeah. you've got so much more like room to go. But if you're like trying to lose 10 pounds, like you can be aggressive and like get that done in a month. If you like, be like really aggressive and like it's only four weeks and it's only 10 pounds. Like there's, those are different things than trying to lose. Like there's a, there's a difference between, I think this, and maybe it's just an argument of semantics, but it's like doing a little mini cut is not really like a weight loss journey. You're just like tightening up a little bit yeah. versus like you got 50 plus pounds to lose. Like this is a whole like lifestyle. Like a lot of shit is going to change in your life to, to, to lose that 50 pounds. And that's going to take some time and it's actually going to be better off if it takes a little longer. Yeah. I think, I think those same people, they, they probably have tried like aggressive things in the past and it has maybe worked for like a short period of time. And then they go back to like, okay, I'm just going to stop weighing myself and stop, you know, stop doing these habits that I've built and just kind of go like they let one day turn into a week and then a week turn into four weeks and then four weeks turn into a year of just kind of reverting back to their old habits. It's not like they I think a lot of fitness coaches who have not been overweight, they think that their clients are just like all of a sudden they flip this switch that's just like fuck it. It doesn't work like that. It happens gradual and it starts with just them giving up one habit. Mm -hmm. So if they are like, maybe they had a habit of going for a walk every single morning and maybe they're, maybe they got called in for work early one day and so they didn't get their morning walk in that day. And then after work, they were super exhausted. They made an excuse and they didn't get their walk in that day. Okay, cool. That's just one day. But if if then the next day another roadblock comes up and then they start losing their momentum slowly and then they start chipping away at their momentum. Now, now they're not tracking this day because it's their friend's birthday and they don't know for sure what's in the restaurant food. Okay, now they're not tracking for one day. They haven't hit their walk in a week and maybe they're not drinking as much water. They're skipping meals. Now Now it's starting to snowball a little bit more. Then they stopped weighing themselves because they realize, oh, I'm bloated. I feel like crap. I don't, I don't think it's good for me to weigh myself. Okay. Now they have no idea where they're at as far as their weight. So now that metric is gone. Now they don't feel guilt from the scale. So now it's like it's compiling. And so it is this snowball effect. It's not like anybody just flips the switch and says, well, I've been working on all this stuff for six months, but... You know what? Today, fuck it. I don't care anymore. I'm just going to quit. It doesn't work like that. And I think everyone thinks that people just like quit, but really it's this gradual process of like losing their momentum slowly over time. And uh and so that's kind of what we're trying to do is just keep that momentum going. And if you miss a day of your freaking morning walk, like who cares? Get get back on it tomorrow, you know? That's a super good way of explaining it. I think a, a way that I try and talk about this is referring to like zooming out on the calendar. It's like, okay, you know, you missed your walk today. You, you didn't track today. Like, fine. This week wasn't that good. We didn't hit it. That's okay. But, you know, the last three months or the last six months, like you've been really good. Like you've been making a lot of progress. So you can either like throw all that in the garbage if you want. And I wouldn't advise that. Or we can say, okay, we didn't do great this week, but we didn't derail all of our progress nothing metric wise really changed much and we can just as easily get back on track quote unquote tomorrow and yeah. even thinking about like this on off track thing in a binary sense is almost 
it can be destructive as well because you know, again, not hitting your walk isn't isn't a failure. It's just like okay, we you know you didn't do one of the things, but oh. it doesn't mean you you failed everything and it's not worth giving up on the plan for right. That 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 longer term thinking is I think it's really hard to 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 learn that though. Yeah, it is. It's very hard to learn it, and that's why having a coach is so nice because they can point out okay. Oh, I haven't lost weight for the last six weeks. Okay, cool. Like, let's let's zoom out though. Okay, over because over the course of the last like two years, you've lost the, whatever forty something pounds, and so like right now, if we look at your weight loss graph, like it's still sloping all the way down. And so if you look at it that way and you zoom out, like, yeah, you didn't lose weight in the last six weeks. That's because like it's not as urgent as it was in the beginning. Like in the beginning, you were like, you were like, I feel super uncomfortable. Maybe health is an issue. Maybe I just, my everything's hurting. I'm sore all the time. I have aches and pains. I can't walk up and down the stairs without being out of breath. Like that is a shitty place to be. But now like you're feeling yourself, you're confident, you're, you're taking photos again. You know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're not the fat friend anymore. There's other people that are fatter. <laughs> like, you know, like yeah, that's, yeah. it sounds fucked up, but you're not the fat friend that's anymore. True. Like, so, so there's not this urgency, right? And like, you're getting attraction, you're, you know, you're getting attraction from the opposite sex again, like, you know, whatever. And so there's not this urgency, but like, if you zoom out, you're still making good progress over the course. Like if you averaged your weight loss out over the course of the amount of weeks you've been doing it, it's still really good. You're still averaging, you know, 0.7 pounds per week or whatever it is. So it really does help to have a coach to remind you that. And I'm not just saying that because I am a coach. Remember, I had a coach before I ever became a coach. And so I believed in the power of coaching and like, obviously, I struggled with drug addiction. I had a sponsor. And if you guys don't know what a sponsor is in like 12 step programs, it's basically like a coach that helps you with your sobriety, with your, your clean time. They help you like remember your, your goals of like, I don't want to throw away my fucking life and go to jail or die. Like, Oh, that's a good thing to remember. I should probably have somebody in my corner that kind of reminds me of that. You know, when I think "Eh, maybe a beer sounds like a good idea or, you know, smoking a joint sounds like a good idea. Well, it's probably not. I should probably call somebody and like tell them what's going on with me. Well, cool. It's the same thing with kind of a coach. It's like, it's learning how to have that support and community to help you look at the long-term game of how far you've came and what you have to lose if you give up now. Right. Cause it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Like the longer you do this, the more you have to lose. Because and you've come I, so far. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you've built this entire new life for yourself, man. You're going to throw it all away for whatever. Like it's, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And, uh, and I think in the beginning, you have a lot less to lose. Like you, if you have a hundred pounds to lose and you lost five or 10 pounds of it, it's a lot easier to say fuck it. And like, yeah, I don't, eh, I kind of like food more than I like this 10 pounds lost. Right. So I'm just going to go back to doing what I was doing. It's, it's a lot harder when you have lost like a significant amount of weight and then you're fucking scared of going back to the person you were before because you built this new amazing life and persona for yourself and you don't want to go back to being that person again. Adding on to this, I think it's also one of the other advantages of having a coach is appropriate goal setting. I think that people often will pick a number of weight loss. Like I want to lose 50 pounds and, and, and that's great, but it's just an arbitrary number. And so they get to 45 pounds down and that lasts five pounds just based on like potential for loss. Like it gets harder to lose weight as you lose more, yeah. just a math problem. So because of that, you still keep chasing this, like this last five pounds and stressing yourself out about it and getting scared about going back. But it's like, your body is great. You have other goals rather than rather than other goals that are way more important and more impactful than hitting the cert, a certain number on the scale. And not that that's not valuable. It just doesn't mean as much as you think you it, it, you it doesn't mean as much as you think it does. And you just picked it arbitrarily at the beginning. If you would have set that goal uh, at a different time, maybe you would have said, "Oh, when I get to whatever 170 pounds." then then I'm good. But you picked, you know, 50 pounds to loss and 50 pounds loss makes you at 165. And so now all of a sudden it's like a failure. But resetting these goals and having someone externally to look at you and what you're doing without your emotions and all the things of your life 
is, is extremely valuable to be like, Hey, you can get that goal, but here's what it's going to take. Are you willing and able to do that? If yes, then let's go for it. If not, then cool. We're good right here. And let's just make that the new goal rather than chasing something that we're not going to get. Yeah, I think a lot of people there they have like really they really enjoy their social lives and like I I'm somebody where like I'll go out maybe once or twice a week I'll go out to eat something or I'll go out with friends or whatever but like I'm not that person that has functions going on five nights out of the week like that would burn me out I, I'm just not that guy um, but I have a lot of clients who are they're like that and they're really going out and they really have work functions and work dinners and then they got their anniversary and they got this and they got like so many things that they have to juggle and i'm like you do know that this is going to make fat loss infinitely harder right and especially if you are trying to lose that last 10 pounds or whatever and that's why i i can't be fucking bothered to try and help somebody lose that last 10 pounds i don't fucking care about it like I want to help somebody lose their first 50 pounds or their first hundred pounds. Like that's what, that's what mainly people like the people I work with is like, they have a lot of weight to lose and it's fucking important to them because they want to be able to play with their kids and they want to be able to, to be around like their, their mom didn't live as long as they could have, or, you know, whatever. It's just, it's a more impactful goal than like, I just want to be a size smaller in this swimsuit. It's like, I don't fucking care about that. Like that's super surface level to me. And I'm not like, I'm not the coach for you. If you want to step on stage and get super shredded, like it's just not my thing. Yeah. And and those things are just, they're not going to change people's lives as much. Sure. It's great to, you know, have abs and feel great. And that's all cool and fun and nothing like wrong with that, Mm -hmm. but it's not actually going to like, change your life that much (laughs) like no one's gonna you're not gonna get a promotion because you have a six-pack because you lost you know eight pounds like that's not the thing but you might be extremely more confident having lost 70 pounds and that's the thing that gives you more energy so you can work hard as you get a promotion like that might be the the chain of events that happens but you know losing eight pounds ten pounds like it's just it's just not gonna change your life not to discourage anyone from like chasing that thing but again you gotta understand whether the the juice is worth the squeeze kind of thing yeah, it's just it's just for the people who have like intense crazy social lives and stuff like that. It's 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 like okay, do you want to do you want to say no to a bunch of things in your life so that you can drop another pound this week? Okay. Well, if you do, if you do want fat loss more than you want that goal, like more than you want the the social life this week, then like cool, that's going to align and you're going to be able to make it happen. The thing about it is like when the when the feeling of uncomfortable being uncomfortable is like greater than the fear of change, like that's when the change happens, right? Like you have to be uncomfortable to the point where like you're not afraid to say no to people or things or places or whatever. And sometimes saying no is the right answer. And I think that coaches are like afraid to say that because they want to be the everybody's buddy and you can fit all these foods into your diet and still lose weight and like yeah da, 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 i'm everybody's friend you know but it's the truth is is like yeah pro- you probably shouldn't like you probably shouldn't try to fit those things into your diet all the time you probably shouldn't uh say yes to every social situation if you're in a fat loss phase you probably shouldn't like do all these things that are going to be counted. You probably shouldn't stay up till 2 a.m. and drink alcohol. Like you probably shouldn't do all those things if you have bigger goals. And people really suck at playing the tape forward. They really suck at being like, okay, how am I going to feel about this tomorrow, right? Or how am I going to feel about this on Monday when I got to check in with my coach? How am I going to feel about this? How am I going to feel about this? They suck at that. They're like, mmm, cake, mmm, carrot cake, mmm, this, mmm, pizza, mmm. And it's just like, they're so, they're so in the moment. And it's like, cool, that works like with meditation and like gratitude and all that. But like, maybe you should, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't be in the moment with like the food, your food choices as much. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no, that's so good. I, this is a thing that like, that bugs me a little bit on online too, is, is a lot of the talk about like, and, and it comes almost like from the, the evidence-based quote unquote community, people pushing the calorie deficit and it's like, okay, well you can eat pizza, have beers and still lose weight. It's like, yeah, yeah, you could, but like, but should you like, is this, I, I get that that might be better than whatever you were doing before. And yes, it can produce weight loss, but is that yeah. 
the thing that we should be striving for. Like, I'm not sure. And personally, I, I struggle with this because I get that it's better, but like, well, maybe we can aim a little bit higher. Like maybe we can be on the like, hey, you should only eat whole foods and, you know, healthy stuff grown from the earth and blah, 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 but also be in a calorie deficit. Like it's not about being keto and paleo. It's just about like, we don't need to eat foods that are not good for us regularly and have a treat now and then obviously go for it. But should this be part of the plan? I, like I, I, I'm, I'm not sure of the answer and I go back and forth on this. I think if you look at the diet of somebody that you're like, wow, they have an amazing physique you're like the majority of the time you're going to see someone who eats a lot of whole foods. You're going to see someone that makes a lot of basic meals at home. And then when you see them out, they're not saying no to things. They're not like, Oh, I can't have chicken wings. I'm on a diet. I can't have pizza. I'm on a diet, but they're probably not going out all the time. They're probably not like, they're probably pick and choosing those spots. And what I tell my clients is like, if it's a fuck yes, it's a fuck yes. If it's not a fuck yes, it's a fuck no. In other words, like I have raised my standards with pizza, for example. I'm not going to have Domino's. I'm not going to have Little Caesars. I'm not going to have mediocre pizza. Like if I'm having pizza, I've got a calorie budget. And for me, it's worth it for me to go over my budget for the day or whatever. If it's really fucking good pizza. But I'm not going to Costco and spending 800 calories of my budget or 1600 calories of my budget on two slices of pizza. Like, I'm just not doing it. I'm just not doing it. It's not that enjoyable to me. So I've raised my standards and that's, that's another tip for like people who want to lose a lot of weight. Raise your standards with stuff like the cookie from Safeway or from your grocery store where like it's kind of fucking dry and it doesn't taste that good, but like it is a cookie. Like it's probably not a fuck yes. But maybe that crumble cookie that's 800 calories and it's like warm and gooey, fresh out the oven, maybe that's a fuck yes. Cool. Have that crumble cookie. I'd rather you have that than spend 800 calories on like three of those shitty cookies. Yeah. yeah man, a million percent agreed with that. Yeah. Like there's so much good food out there now and talking junk food. Like there's so many good things and it's not even like more expensive. When I was living downtown Toronto, which I don't, I live like in the suburbs now, like there's amazing pizza downtown. Like there's no excuse to be ordering Domino's pizza pizza is a chain we have here like whatever these kind of like fast food style pizzas you could easily get like a phenomenal like real pizza for basically the same price like there's no reason to have that if you're gonna if you're budgeting calories or whatever it's and also like uh, a better pizza is usually less calories anyways than like the fast food kind of garbage uh, version of it as well pizza specifically maybe not so much with other foods but I think that that's true because it also uh, limits some of the guilt I find where you have like a dessert or a junk food where it didn't even taste that good. You didn't even enjoy it. You know that you, you know, blew over your calories, but you also didn't even enjoy it. And like, ah, you have this internal feeling that that really wasn't worth it. And then this can start, you know, some sort of other like binge cycle where you're chasing something else yeah. or, you know, you're, you're going for some, and you just go way farther down the hole than you would have otherwise if you had just had the thing that was really delicious that you really wanted, you're like, okay, that was a lot of calories, but fuck that was, that was worth it. And you don't even feel bad about it after. Yeah. I I don't know. Like, I think what some people will do is they'll be like, Oh, I'm craving, uh, I'm craving carne asada fries. Okay. That's, that's my thing. Like if I'm going to be like a fuck, yes, I go and get carne asada fries. So I'm craving carne asada fries. Right. And instead of doing the carne asada fries, I'm like, hmm, maybe I'll just make my own carne asada fries. And so I, I get the, you know, I get the potatoes and I fry them up in the air fryer and I like use ground beef or some bullshit. And cause it's lean, lean ground beef. And then I use fat free cheese and I use light sour cream. And it's like, cool. Like it may taste okay, but like chances are it's probably not it's probably not going to be worth <laughs> yes. like, it's probably, I'm probably still going to be like, yeah, I still want real carne asada fries. Dude, I cannot stand <laughs> like quote unquote healthy desserts. It's one of my biggest things that upsets me in, uh, in all of like fitness and even not even outside of fitness, just in the world. You mean like, like the, you mean like the, like, Oh, sub out like dates for this, like cheesecake and like dates and almonds or like, the yeah. ones that aren't even lower calories, but they're just like more whole foods and they try to make them into desserts. Is that what you mean? Correct. Those yeah. things that are like, they, they make, you know, we didn't use butter. We used this, or we didn't use sugar. We used 
dates or we you know they're yeah. making ingredient subs and then trying to play it off like it tastes exactly the same which it obviously doesn't but but even more than that is the ones that are like oh just like no calorie anything it tastes like perfectly amazing or it's a vegan low calorie cheesecake like the best part of the cheesecake is that it's full of fat like if yeah. you take that out like it's not cheesecake sure it tastes okay but you are badly fooling yourself if you think that those things taste the same or better that that's the worst one like oh it's it's actually even better than the real one give me a break dude i think it's fitness coaches who like are like oh my god this tastes just like the real thing and it's like dude your your palate is terrible like you're a (laughs) fitness coach you've been eating low calorie foods for like the past 25 years like your palate is awful to somebody who actually eats these foods and then they try that, they're gonna be like, "This is the worst thing I've ever tasted." Yeah. Have you? <laughs> like, do you have? Do you have one of those ninja creamy things? Those yeah. ice cream things? Yeah, How's yeah. the ice cream from that? I've not. I've I, not had it. Dude, to be honest, I haven't found a recipe to where I'm like, "This doesn't have a little bit of iciness to it." So maybe I need to play around a little bit more. It's not. It doesn't taste like ice cream, dude. Yeah. Like I. Not surprised. I don't care who you are. Like. It's cool. You can get a high protein like ice cream like thing. But like for me to make it taste good, I have to put in, you know, 300 calories of Reese's anyways. in the thing. <laughs> and so it's like, I don't know, for me personally, I'm like, I'll, I'll, I'd rather just go get um, a pint of like light ice cream or something and then like just just go buy that myself. And yeah. so and I don't I don't usually like do the the like. I'm not going to go buy a pint of Ben and Jerry's and like weigh out like a third of a cup of Ben and Jerry's because it's like this much fucking ice cream, dude. But like to me, I'd rather have more ice cream. So what I do is I will I'll get like the ice cream bars. I'll get the the Yasso Greek yogurt. They have ones they dip in chocolate. To me, those are really good. They're only 150 calories and I can easily have one of those at the end of the night and it's it's so easy to fit that into my calories and kind of kills that that craving for ice cream for me. So that one actually does kill that craving for me if I do like have that ice cream craving. But a lot of times it'll be the end of the night and I won't even have one because I'm just like, eh, just don't, yeah. I just don't even crave it. Like I, I'm just not, a, I'm not a hundred percent like craving that food anymore. So it's really like being in tune with what you're craving and, and understanding that like, if you want that thing, you can go have it. But like most of the time, I'm just like, yeah, I want my goal more than I want like a pint of Ben and Jerry's right now. Like I want to be out of this fat loss phase a little bit quicker. And if I have that pint of Ben and Jerry's, that's 1500 calories. That's going to kind of shoot me in the foot even like maybe for the whole week if I'm not super dialed. Exactly. I, I think some some of the things in, in the name of sustainability, having, you know, healthy protein ice cream, protein cookies, you know, whatever, all this stuff. W- one of the things that I also think about it is that it is, um, it's not like repairing is maybe too strong of a word, but like repairing the behavior with wanting to have a cookie or dessert all of the time, right? We talk about trying to be, you know, healthy outside of just calories and, and whatnot. And whatever may be emotional or stress things are related to having these types of snacks, which are very common. If you're just subbing that in for a healthy thing, yep, it's definitely better, I guess. But are you really satisfying that? Is that the thing that's going to make you go for the long term? Because what happens when your ninja creamy thing breaks or you forgot to make it the night before? Well, then you're just going for the Ben and Jerry's because you haven't replaced that not needing to have ice cream every single night or whatever it is. And I think that's a bit of a slippery slope that I don't see too many people really thinking about. Yeah. I mean, the real test is if you have kids, right. And, and I don't have kids, but like my, my friends who do have kids, like that's the real test because then you're going to have your food environment is going to have a lot of like junk and snacks and sweets, and they're not going to finish all their food. And so you don't want to waste this. You finish the food. And so that's the real test is like if you have all these foods or maybe you have a significant other who like they have a huge sweet tooth, right? But they don't struggle with their weight or something like that. Like I do. I My my girlfriend, she has a huge sweet tooth, dude. She has a, a chocolate cupboard. It's a cupboard. 
Like literally I open up a cupboard and like chocolate falls out. I'm like, what is this? Like, this is the worst thing for me while I'm in a calorie <laughs> deficit to even be like near this. And so like I, if I even open that dude, like, like a, a freaking lint truffle chocolate is just going to fall into my mouth. Like <laughs> literally, like, like literally. Uh, but you know what? The, but she doesn't like, I'm with her all the time. She does not binge on these foods. She has like, one and you should see how she eats it she's like she takes like one little piece and she's like and like savors it before she like puts the next one in and then she may even forget that they're even there i am not like that Mm -hmm. i am like super food focused and i'm like boom 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 i got like four in my mouth (laughs) and i'm like chewing them all at the same time so being around her it teaches me that okay i need to learn how to like slow down and just like enjoy the the chocolate that i'm on put it into my calories and be done with it and i don't need to i create these bright lines with myself right where like i'm if i'm cooking dinner at her house and in my head i'm like chocolate cupboard i want one of those chocolates or whatever while i'm cooking this meal because i'm hungry it's like i create a bright line with myself where i'm like i can have a couple of those chocolates but i have to eat a real meal with protein and fiber first and so i create that rule with myself no one's creating this rule for me no one's holding me accountable to it i just created it in my head where i'm like i cannot have that food until i eat some food with protein and fiber first and then once i have the protein and fiber i'm drinking water i'm hydrating while i'm eating it then afterwards you know an hour later i'll probably be like yeah i do want one of those and i'll go and have one or two right but it's never it's never like i'm just eating them mind like mindlessly while i'm cooking if that makes sense it makes total sense to me i i kind of refer to this as this is like it's almost like end stage of fitness journey where you've changed your identity to be a quote unquote fit person and it's like a, what would a fit person do well they would probably have a real meal first and they might still have some dessert but just a little bit They might have one, they'd enjoy it, and then move on with their life. Now, some people that obviously comes way easier to than others, Mm -hmm. like your girlfriend versus yourself. For myself, I'm also like that where I can just have one piece of chocolate and move on with it. And the only, like, I didn't train myself to do this, but my mom loves chocolate. And growing up, my mom's whole family loves chocolate. And growing up, we always had chocolate in the house. There's always chocolate and cookies and there's always stuff around. And I was never, like, scolded for having it. I was never told like, you can't have that or that's Mm. bad. Or I was obviously I understood that it's like, this is junk food and you can't just have this for dinner and all that stuff. But it was never like demonized to me. And so I never got like overly excited to have it where it's like, oh my God, I only get chocolate once a week. I'm going to have as much as I can because it was always just available to me. And that that just stuck with me now. Like I have my coffee, I have a piece of chocolate Mm. and like, I'm good. I don't need to have seven pieces of chocolate and I don't even, I don't even want that. Now that's extremely lucky. I'd say for me, because it's, that's probably not the case for most people. And I wish I could say that I have some strategy as to how to do this, but I don't know, maybe go back to when you were three years old and have a mom that loves chocolate, Like (laughs) you know, that's not, but that's not real. Um, but, but that's, but that's my reality. And I think that getting towards that, like identity shift to like, Hey, I'm a, I'm a fit person and fit and healthy people like do these things. And so that way it's not restrictive. It's just like, this is what I do. I don't have to force myself to get up and go for a walk because I just get up and go for walks. This is what I do. It's part of my life now. And that takes a really long time, but that's like the, the long, long term game. Yeah. I mean, that right there is, is super interesting to me. The fact that, you know, okay, you grew up around these foods. They were not off limits. They were not demonized, but you understood like what's acceptable. Like how can I kind of like, these are a treat. It's not a meal. Right. And so I grew up with a cereal yo-yo diet or mom surprise there. Right. So when there were, when I like have my Halloween candy and whatever, like we never had candy in the house, no sweets in the house, not any whatsoever, unless it was like Weight Watchers stuff. And like, yeah, that stuff's gross. So I, so I would, so I would have my Halloween candy and I would have to hide it from my mom because she would tell me like, you have to hide this, hide this from me. And so it like created this crazy, like relationship with candy where I was like, I was like, whoa, okay, I can't let my mom have this candy because she can't control herself with it. And so 
literally like i would catch her like having reese's like late at night and stuff and and like like shame eating like in the dark <laughs> wow that, yeah that's that's heavy yeah 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 for sure and so you wonder why like for me it's like the first time i was around like a family i go and spend you know spend the night at a friend's house and like their family just had that stuff just like sitting on the counter i'd be like oh my god we can just have this like whenever <laughs> And like, I'd go crazy. I go, yeah. they'd be like, yeah, have as much as you want. I'd go crazy because yeah. I'm like, I'm not allowed to have this stuff. Yeah. This is yeah. like, this is like good, good crack right here. I'm on <laughs> it. Like, you know, and so it, it, it definitely is a completely different dynamic. And when something's like off limits, it's like as a kid, you're like, ooh, what is that? Like, I'm going to freaking get my hands on it. Yeah. It, it, it's very true. And I, I mean, there's obviously, there's no way to go back into your childhood and like, and fix this, but like, I don't have kids. You don't have kids. Like, I think that I will not be like very purposely not be like, you know, restrictive. I'm not anyway. So I don't have to change my own behavior to do this, but like not be restrictive and, you know, have things open and like, Hey, if you want it, you can have it. But like, there are limits around these things that you can, you can, you know, not, we're not having chocolate cake for dinner, but like we'll have chocolate cake after dinner and, and yeah. that's normal and not make yeah. a big deal of it. Right. But maybe it's like, it's, I think the thing here is that, some of the things that are part of one's behavior, it's not really your fault. Yeah. And like, and, and that's tough to, to understand because it means you also can't really fix it. But, but acknowledging it means that maybe you can take some steps to improve it or change some of your behaviors. It'll, it'll be difficult, but the alternative is also difficult. So make a choice kind of thing. It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. You know, like you, you can't, you can't pass that on to other people. And it's, it's, it's easy to do. It's easy to pass that on to other people, but it's, it's, so it's not your fault that you have this poor relationship with chocolate or food or whatever. You have this fear of food, but it is your responsibility to, to change it. And it's going to take a lot of fucking work for some people to change it, but it's, it's very valuable because then you don't pass it on to your kids. You don't pass it on to your best friends. You don't pass it on to people you care about. And not only that, but like it's, you don't, you don't fucking struggle with it anymore. And coming from somebody who I wouldn't say I struggle with it, but coming from somebody who's still very food focused at a healthy body fat percentage and who has a good relationship with food and with fitness, but who's still very food focused, like, it's still a work in progress and it always will be. Yeah. And, and, and that's okay as well. Like yeah. we're so used to things wanting to be easy, fast, simple, instant that it's almost like anything that's difficult is, is, is seen as wrong or bad or, yeah. or demonized. And it's okay to do hard things. Like you are resilient and you are capable of doing hard things yeah. and doing that will most of the time, be of some benefit to you especially if you want whatever that that end goal is like it wasn't it's not easy to change your life but it is beneficial to do so yeah 100 percent. yep i agree good stuff man i mean i think that we've covered a lot and i think that we're gonna get a little uh, a little heavy if we keep going down this rabbit hole <laughs> so i think we should we should uh let's we should, go there we no i'm just kidding <laughs> I think we should uh wrap We're going to go here. right into my childhood. <laughs> what was your first memory? <laughs> um was there anything else that you wanted to chat about today? Anything that we didn't that we didn't cover? No, man. I I really like where the conversation led cuz it it was it's it's always interesting for me to hear like how people grew up in their food environment and so to hear the differences between your food environment and my food environment it makes a lot of sense, right? So yeah. It's, I think a lot of people will relate to what I was saying there and, uh, and hopefully get some, some useful takeaway from it and, and understand that, Hey, it is your responsibility. You have to, you have to address it. You can't just walk around in fear of, Oh my God, this food needs to be in the highest cabinet above here. Because if I even look at it, like, you know, I literally have to deal with a chocolate cupboard when I'm trying to make <laughs> dinner, like literally. So, yeah, no. man, I'm, good conversation. Appreciate you having me on. Of course, man. Appreciate you, uh, you as well. I'm sure there's plenty of uh, really good tips for people to to take from this. Um, if people want to get in contact with you and stay up to date with everything you got going on, what's your uh, what's the best place to reach you? 
I'll throw yeah, it in the show notes, of course. Just, just Instagram, Jeff Pacman Fitness. Um, that's where I'm the most active. Awesome. Jeff Pacman Fitness, I will throw it in the show notes. Any last message you want to leave the people with here in closing? Uh, just, uh, just do the hard things, especially when you don't want to. Love it. Love it. Thank you, brother. Jeff Packman Fitness on Instagram. Uh, follow me as well. Give the podcast a rating, review, all those things. Uh, helps the show grow and helps more people. I appreciate each and every one of you for listening. Go outside. Be a good person. See you next time.